Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to both Emerald Secondary College and the Emerald Performing Arts Centre. My name is Emily Pearson and I'm the science coordinator here at the school. Before I introduce our speakers for tonight, I'd like to take the time to just acknowledge the efforts of the Mount Burnett Observatory team. This evening was made possible due to the efforts of volunteers and I ask that you join me in giving them a round of applause for their efforts. Our first speaker for this evening is Professor Carl Glazebrook, an observational astronomer at Swinburne University of Technology. Professor Glazebrook's research interests include observational cosmology, the formation and evolutionary history of galaxies, and developing novel astronomical instrumentation. Please welcome Professor Carl Glazebrook. Thank you, and thank you all for coming out on this fine evening. So, my story tonight is going to be about the story of the origin of galaxies. And it's not a boring story because there's a surprise at the end. So I'm going to finish with a mystery we haven't yet solved the answer to. So I kind of divided my talk into two parts. The first part is going to be about galaxies. Let's start with what a galaxy is and then we can come back in the second part to how they form. So. Um, Hands up, those of you who think they know what a galaxy is. Anybody care to, care to give definition? Not you lot. <laughs> Hands up. Boy there, What's the, what is a galaxy? Just you can pick the answer. Okay, um, so, so I hope most of the people in the audience has a sort of vague idea that a galaxy is something that looks something like this. This is a, a spiral galaxy. Um, we live in a spiral galaxy, it's called the Milky Way, and it's a vast conglomeration of stars. And you see why it's called a spiral galaxy, it's got a nice little spiral wave of stars coming out from the center. It's looking from the top and looking from the side, it looks a bit like a fried egg, a little bulge in the middle. Now, this isn't our galaxy, this is another galaxy called M Messier 51, or the Whirlpool Galaxy. Uh, if it was our galaxy, then it's quite similar. Our sun would be out somewhere here in one of these arms. So if we were to zoom in, it's a zoom down into the arms of our galaxy, you're beginning now to see the structure and the, and the, the stars within it. Um, all these tiny little dots are stars. Most of these are much brighter than our sun. And these sort of pink things here are clouds of, uh, of, of gas, very hot gas, which is glowing in hydrogen emission. So you are here, kind of, somewhere in sort of one of these spiral arms. So we can zoom down a little bit more. Let's take this, this box. We zoom some more. We start to see uh, individual stars now. And it's so crowded, it looks very crowded. All these stars are sort of look very close together. And in a box like this, perhaps our sun would be one of the very faint little orange ones here. Um, but these stars, they look close in this picture, but this picture can't see everything. And in fact, these stars are actually quite far apart. If we were to consider our solar system, then here's a picture of our solar system showing the orbits of the planets, then our Earth would be in here. And if you think of the distance between the Earth and the Sun as what we call one astronomical unit, then the entire solar system is 40 astronomical units across, um, 40 times the Earth's Sun distance out to Pluto. But then the nearest star, Alpha Centauri, that will be 260,000 times further. So distance to the nearest star is 260,000 times the distance to the Sun. So it gives you some idea of how empty the space between the stars really is. So I said the whirlpool is in our galaxy. Here is a picture of our galaxy. It's a nice picture showing the center of our galaxy rising over this mountain called Devil's Tower in Wyoming. Uh, you may remember from the Close Encounter movie, those of you who are old enough. And you can sort of see this sort of stream of stars. If you take this picture of the, of the galaxy and unfold it on the sky, make an all-sky picture of our galaxy, it looks like this. And of course, 
It looks like a band. You're all familiar with a band of the Milky Way. The reason it looks like a band is because we're inside it. We're in this disk of this galaxy looking back towards the center. And you can just see the lights of the center peeking over the bottom here, peeking over these, these dusty regions in between. Um, so our galaxy has a mass about 50 billion times the mass of the sun in total. So that's a very large number. You can also see that the stars in the galaxy are different colors. Some are quite blue, some are yellow, some are very red. And the important thing is that galaxies are made of stars of different kinds. So let's take this little part here. This is the center of the galaxy. This is a, what's called a, the bulge of our galaxy. And we'll zoom in again. And the region there will look something like this. So this is a little patch in the galaxy. Every little dot here is a star. And um, we'll say stars like grain of sands in the, in the universe. They're not kidding, right? And you see most of these are red stars. There's occasional blue stars around. And here's a little cluster of blue stars. Um, here's a big black band, um, which kind of looks like a monster about to eat these stars down here. Do you really have any ideas what this black band is caused by? So hang up right in the corner. No, it's not a black hole. A black hole will be round. Actually, black hole is so small you couldn't see it. These are dust clouds. Um, space, it's not quite a vacuum. There's, there's dust in space, which gets in between us and distant galaxies and stars. When you look to the center of our galaxy, there's, there's muck in the way, which are like a fog that obscures our view. So why do we have red stars and blue stars? Um, so I talked too much about this, just to say that um, you draw a picture of different kinds of stars. Um, we have young stars and old stars, essentially. And the young stars are, are big and blue. And the old stars are big and red. And that's really the basic thing that makes stars look different and galaxies look different. And these are big stars. Our sun is down here, so kind of a little, little star. And when you look at galaxies, you see that um, galaxies really divide into different kinds based on the kind of stars they have. So again, here's it's a spiral like the Milky Way. You have these spiral arms full of blue stars, which are young, and a red bulge in the middle, which is quite old. Um, here's a different kind of galaxy you may have heard about. This is called an elliptical galaxy. And these can be very massive. They can be up to 10 times bigger than these kind of guys. And what we see is all the stars in these galaxies are red, which means all the stars are old, which means that these galaxies have stopped forming new stars. So they're kind of mature, they're getting on, they stop having vigorous young star formation. So astronomers many years ago, 100 years ago, they sort of made a zoo of, of galaxy types. And Hubble was famous for doing this, dividing galaxies into ellipticals and into spirals. As you go along the sequence, the spirals become more and more open. And these are regular spirals, and these are called barred spirals because they have these little bars in the middle. But generally, these are the young active galaxies, and these are the mature old galaxies. But how did, it, how did it get this way? Why do some galaxies have young stars, and why are some just past it? How do galaxies form? So I'll give you the, the cartoon picture of how galaxies in our universe form. So we start with a mysterious substance called dark matter. And this is not a talk about dark matter, but dark matter is fills, fills space but it's not made of atoms. Um, we, we worked out that it accounts on for sort of 90% of the mass of the universe. Um, and dark matter is formed early on in the universe. And early on in the universe, it forms big clouds, which then collapse. When dark matter collapses, it creates potential wells, which then pull in other gas. And so ordinary matter, which some of us like to use the fancy term barium, so it just means atoms, atoms of a gas, are pulled into these dark matter fields of gravity. They're drawn in in big clouds which start to condense and get bigger. And it's kind of a picture. These clouds then shrink down and then form stars and become the galaxies. So that's the basic picture. You start with dark matter in the early universe, which, which collapses under its own gravity to form massive, massive attracting regions, which then pull in atoms to form galaxies. And of course, these are hundreds of thousands of light years across. That's a cartoon, and how do we know that's what really happens? Well, I'm going to show you some, some pictures of galaxy formation in a minute, but what we can do is go better than a cartoon and 
using a supercomputer like we have at Swinburne, so I hope you can all see this, we can make a movie of, of galaxy formation. So I'm going to show you a movie. This movie took about uh, three months of computer time on a thousand CPU cores to make. What we do is we start off, I don't know how well you can see it, we start off with uh, the early universe and clouds of gas swimming around in a sort of maelstrom. And they're being pulled into the centres of these dark matter clouds I talked about earlier. And you see they're beginning to form a concentration. This concentration is the nucleus of a young galaxy. Um, it's getting denser and denser. And you see this, these atoms being pulled into a disk now. You're beginning to see a spiral pattern. You know. This is a simulation of complete physics of dark matter, of atoms, of pressure, of, of temperature and so on. And you see at late times, this has now formed a galaxy looking much like our own. Um, let me run that one more time. Now, look at the time down here. Those of you careful, man, the time down here starts at about a billion years and then runs 13 billion years through the uh, history of the universe. So, <coughs> I, can, I can't quite read it. I think we're now at about uh, 10 billion years and the thing is going to look mature. You see another galaxy being pulled in, another cloud of gas, and forming a, a galaxy very much like the Milky Way. This is a simulation of the formation of the Milky Way. That's fine, we've got a nice spiral. But what about the ellipticals I spoke about earlier? I said there are these other populations of these massive elliptical galaxies. How do they form? So here's a cartoon of how we think they form. You take two of these spirals and then you smash them together in a collision. Um, and that does happen. And I'll show you a picture. Here's a picture of a collision of two of these galaxies. As you, as you might expect, it's a big mess. But this big mess triggers lots of star formation, and we think that's how ellipticals form. Basically, because it's collision, all the stuff is used up to make stars, and there's no gas left to make new stars, so it then becomes round, red, and old. And this is how we think you make an elliptical galaxy. So here is not just a cartoon, here's a simulation of that process, just showing two, two sort of toy models of spiral galaxies here coming together, this is a computer simulation where the motions of a particle has been calculated and you see the merger, everything is flowing apart and the colours of these dots show sort of how old or young the stars are. And as you see, you're getting a burst of blue stars and now they're getting very, very red. There's no more potential to form new stars. And this goes on as they come together again and again and you eventually end up with a round envelope. So here's the final the final coalescence splot. <coughs> okay. So that's great. That's all simulation. So all we need to do to work out if this is the right story is build a time machine, go back in time, and observe the formation of galaxies. That sounds pretty easy, right? So you want to go what Doctor Who, what his phone box, you know. So let's go back 13 billion years and we can observe the formation of galaxies. Wouldn't that be great? Um, well, actually we can do that. Um, <coughs> so the second part of my talk is to tell you how everything comes together, how we can actually observe the origin of galaxies with telescopes. So focusing on origin now. So, of course, um, we don't actually have Doctor Who's time machine, um, but nice if we did. But what we can do is we can use telescopes as time machines. And this is perhaps the most wonderful thing about astronomy is the further you look away in space, the further back in time you see. And it's really quite simple. Um, you, light travels at a speed of 186,000 miles per hour, 300,000 kilometers per second. Um, Near a star is, is so far away, it takes like four years to reach us. So we look at the nearest star, Alpha Centauri, we're looking four years back in time. The nearest galaxy, Andromeda, is a bit further. It's about two million, what we call light years, which means it takes like two million years to reach us. So that means we're seeing the Andromeda galaxy as it was two million years ago. It sounds like a lot, but on the cosmic time scale, it is not a lot. 
And we can even observe as far back as the Big Bang, the origin of the universe, which is about 13 billion years ago. So that's, so that's 13,000 million years compared to 2 million years. And so by doing this, we can observe galaxies at different times in the universe. So here's your telescope. You're looking back in time towards the Big Bang. The further away you see, you're seeing modern galaxies, you're seeing developing galaxies, you're seeing the first galaxies and the first stars. So it's a bit like looking at people. Um, if you're looking at people today, you have you know, a crowd of grown-ups. If you look way across space, we don't see that. We see uh, maybe a, a crowd of school children. You're seeing a development. And if you look really, really far away, perhaps you, see, you start to see baby galaxies that are just, just starting to grow. And that's how we try and observe galaxy formation. So, do you remember I said galaxies today look like this? We have the nice round ellipticals, we have the nice spiral shaped spirals. And the nice feature here about these large galaxies is their beautiful symmetry. These are nice and round, these are symmetrical spirals. They look beautiful, they have wonderful symmetry. Um, flipping them around and look the same. They're not sort of random and unstructured. But what about galaxies 12 billion years ago? Well, I'm going to show you some pictures of galaxies 12 billion years ago. So, in order to do this, we're going to need very large telescopes. So two telescopes in particular um, have been very important for my own observations of galaxies. Um, here is the... Uh, the Magellan Telescope, this is on a mountain in Chile. This mountain is 2,000 metres high, so when you go up there you get a bit short of breath. Uh, it's a very large telescope, this is the dome, and in here you see a 6 metre optical telescope. 6 metre means the mirror is 6 metres across, which is about from here, all the way over to here. So this is, so this is a very large mirror, and it collects a lot of light. So the next telescope we use is a bit higher. Um, we use the Hubble Space Telescope, which is at an altitude of 569 kilometres. Um, so about a, about a thousand, 500 times higher up um, than the Magellan Telescope. The course is in space, which means it can see very clearly. And in particular, we use a famous observation called the Hubble Deep Field. So what was the Hubble Deep Field? Well, astronomers had this brilliant idea of staring at a blank patch of sky for 800 hours with the Hubble Space Telescope. This $20 billion space telescope, the most expensive telescope ever launched, and we decided to stare at nothing for like several days. Uh, why? Well, it turns out that whenever you look in the universe, nothing is not nothing. When you, go, when you observe very faintly, you see more and more galaxies as you peer further and further back in time. And this is the Hubble Deep Field. This is the picture. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to animate it. So let's do this. So we're going to, what we have now is a fly-through of the Hubble Deep Field. Is it going? Yes. Starting with the nearby objects or stars. You see the stars disappearing. And then we're moving out into the universe. And we'll see the galaxies from, from near to far. So these guys, they're all pretty nearby. They're pretty regular. This movie's about a minute. It's going to go gradually backwards through time to the more and more distant objects seen in the Hubble Deep Field. Um, so you see things are beginning to look a bit more regular. Uh, it's still pretty symmetrical. Is there, there's a regular galaxy flying up, up, up there. Uh, that's pretty symmetrical still. Still got elliptical galaxies. There's a nice spiral going past. You're beginning to see something suspicious happening that maybe these spirals are looking a bit more lumpy and misshapen than the ones we know about nearby. And zooming back, starting to see more quite irregular objects and smaller objects as well, because the young galaxies are smaller. You're starting to see all kinds of sort of small, diffuse, very hard to see things. And I think this is the furthest galaxy in the Hubble Deep Field is, is this one here. Okay, but I'll show you some zooms. So Going back to our picture, look, using the Hubble Space Telescope to look way back in time. Here's the modern universe. We have ellipticals, we have spirals, we have emerging galaxies, which are the only examples we know of today that are irregular. And they're quite rare. 
So what we see, if we look back to the first few billion years of the universe, so we're now looking at galaxies one to four billion years old. Um, so here's a picture of a typical galaxy. Um, so these are the sort of the first galaxies, and you see they look nothing like the modern galaxies. They're irregular, lumpy, and structured. You see red lumps and blue lumps, sort of hint of spiral structure, but nothing very regular. And most galaxies back then look like this. They look misshapen, irregular. They're still forming. They're still conglomerating. Um, so that's a picture from Hubble. In space, they can see very clearly. But with Hubble, we can't work out really well how far away galaxies really are. We have to use other telescopes. This is where my own work comes in. So what we do is we go to the Jadam telescope, and here's a picture of the telescope. We use a giant camera. So this camera is about uh, three meters long, attached to the side of this telescope. And we observe the Hubble Deep Field in, in 30 other wavelengths. We observe it all the way from the ultraviolet, sorry, this is the top, top of the bottom, from the ultraviolet to the uh, infrared. So here are the ultraviolet images of, of objects, and here are the infrared images. And you see how the galaxies look a bit different in the, up, up, in the ultraviolet and in the infrared. For example, um, this, this one drops, drops out in, in the ultraviolet and then changes its structure almost as you go into the infrared. And that lets us work out two things. It lets us work out how far away the galaxies are. Um, it also works out how many old stars they have and how massive they might be. And yet, that's what we can't do with Hubble. So just illustrate this. I hope this comes out. <clears throat> Here's a Hubble picture of a plate of a sky, and you can see stars and faint galaxies. If we add the infrared from that ground-based Magellan stuff, you throw up a new population of very red things that weren't revealed before. And that's one of the remarkable things about combining all this data. You begin to see new things. This is where we get to the, the surprise. So, one to four billion years after the Big Bang, so the universe is still a baby. Remember, today we're 13 billion years after the Big Bang. We see these irregular galaxies. But wait, there is something else. There is a surprise. So here's a surprise. We found galaxies that look like this. Um, so we call them uh, red nuggets. Uh, they're kind of like elliptical galaxies today, but they're much smaller and denser. And they're full of old stars. You see the red color here. And those are only seen in infrared images. You don't see them in optical images. So that's why it took a long time to find them. Um, and those are mature galaxies in, a, in the early universe. This is, this is uh, interesting enough to have a paper in a major journal and nice press release talking about this. The discovery of galaxies in the early universe mature beyond their years. This is actually a surprise. We didn't expect to find these. Um, just to give you some perspective, um, we're seeing massive and mature galaxies only one and a half billion years after the Big Bang. So here's some scales. So here's the Milky Way today. About 50 billion suns in it, perhaps. Uh, way back then, the Milky Way would have been like this. It would have been like a fraction of the size and only having about one billion suns. Whereas these galaxies are more like this size and have about 100 billion suns. So somehow, the universe found a way to make stars very quickly and make these galaxies very quickly, which is rather remarkable. And we're still looking for an explanation of this. Just to give you an analogy, remember our picture of baby universe and baby galaxies. So you kind of look, expect to look back at early universe and look see galaxies like this looking like little babies. Um, but we find uh, galaxies more like this. The tack of the giant baby. So you have these giant babies, and what's more, they're mature as well. They're more they, uh, old enough to uh, start exhibiting adult behavior. So that's kind of crazy. And the question arises, uh, why are they out there? How do they form? And the cool thing is, I don't know, because this is the next step of our science stories to go use more telescopes to investigate these galaxies and figure out how they got to be so grown up so quickly. Thank you very much.
So, I'm supposed to throw balls to the audience if you ask a good question. So, questions? Come on. Someone catch that and wake up. Oh, 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 oh. Let me ask a question. Uh, what's the title? Hydrogen, helium, and a few other elements. More questions? Um, what is the centre of the Hidden Day Galaxy besides stars? It's probably a multiple black hole, one in the middle of every galaxy. About a, ten, about a billion times heavier than the Sun. And about a hundred times bigger than our solar system. Over there. Why do stars twinkle? Twinkle because of the Earth's atmosphere. And we look for the air, the air is unsteady, it makes the light move around. Good question. Yeah, you get the balls. You have to ask a question now. Sorry? Um, these are the biggest telescopes. These are the Keck telescopes in Hawaii. Their mirrors are 10 meters across, which is the size of this room. Okay. Let go and rain up there. I don't travel into space. No, I haven't. But I'm going to do that in a couple of years so I'll let you know what it's like. I'm saving up. Go ahead and read. Ah. So when the star forms, all the gas falls together into a big pile and it gets very, very hot. And that makes a process happen called nuclear fusion where the hydrogen atoms combine to helium atoms. And that releases a lot of energy. You don't get balls, I've got something for the next talk. You can ask a question. Well, we think the little, little galaxies happen because two spirals merge. And then there's an evening out of the gravitational field. Uh, and because there's no gas, there's no settling, and so it forms an elliptical shape. Oh, so many questions now. That's a girl there. Hope I don't hurt anybody. Planets. They're made of the same stuff as the stars. The big planets are made mostly of hydrogen and helium, a little bit of other stuff. The small planets they can't keep their hydrogen and helium because they don't have enough gravity. So they're made of the heavier elements like iron and, and silicon and so on. It's what's called the rocky planets. Um, I'm going to see how far I can throw this ball. There's a boy way at the back. <laughs> Maybe I'll do that next time. <laughs> what happens if you go in a black hole? Um, well, it depends how big it is. If you're going for a very small one, it'll be probably be torn apart before you go across the, across the horizon. If you fall into a big, very, very big one, there's a possibility you could find your way through a wormhole and end up somewhere else in space and time. Are there any other shaped galaxies or are they just spirals? Uh, well, spirals and are the big ones. In the local universe, we have uh, small, small galaxies called dwarf galaxies, can be quite irregular in shape. There's dwarf ellipticals and there's dwarf irregulars. Uh, in the other universe, they come in every, every shape, including triaxial shapes and clumpy disks and these compact nuggets. Uh, two more kids. There's a kid at the back in blue, but I'm not sure I might kill somebody if I throw this all the way. You, are you up for this? Everyone duck. Oh, nice catch, Mum. I had a question already. Um, so the big ones are made of hydrogen and helium mostly. The small ones are made of, of rock, which is silicon and iron and carbon and oxygen. One more ball. That boy is looking very determined to get a ball. So I'll stop finish with you. Can you catch? Almost.
It was launched in 1986. And it's probably going to last another five years before all the bits wear out. Yes, we're going to launch something called the James Webb Space Telescope in about 2018, 2019, um, which is a six meter telescope, so about three times bigger. They're going to send it all the way out beyond the orbit of Mars, where space is very cold and very dark. And that's much better for doing infrared observing. So they'll actually be able to see back to only a few hundred million years after the Big Bang and seeing the very first stars of one of its, one of its goals. Like over there. Oh, can I show this? Can I show this? I got it somewhere. Um, it's another talk. But yes, this is, this is really cool. I didn't have the excuse to show it in this talk, but I'll show it since you asked. Yeah. Um, so, while well, this is loading, let me just tell you. So the nearest galaxy, as we saw it earlier, is the Andromeda galaxy. And that's about 2 million light years away. So we've known for about 100 years that that galaxy is moving towards us at about 300 kilometers per second. Um, but we're never able to measure the sideways motion on the sky. So we didn't know if it's moving enough sideways that it would miss us or not. Okay. But last year, the Hubble Space Telescope actually actually measured this. So let's show you. So here's the Andromeda galaxy. So 100 years ago we measured it moving towards us at 300 kilometers per second. Um, so here's a movie that NASA made. Here's Andromeda. And what the Hubble Space Telescope did was it observed a very small patch in that galaxy for about, about 10 years. Here's a very small patch. This patch is filled with the stars of the Andromeda galaxy. And this shows what you found. This is, shows what happens over 10,000 years. You see how the stars move across the frame compared to the objects behind it, the background galaxies. That tells you that the Andromeda galaxy is moving. So of course Hubble can't observe for 30,000 years. But they're able to measure the very slight sideways motion, which means, it turns out, that um, the sideways motion is actually pretty small. And the Andromeda galaxy is actually coming right for us. And it's going to collide with our galaxy Milky Way in about 4 million years. Um, don't worry, it's a long time. And uh, here's a simulation of the, uh, the future of our galaxy. So here's the Milky Way galaxy turning around. With the stars going around. This is, this is years in the future on the bottom left. And then Zooming out, <coughs> here's Andromeda. Coming into the frame. Dun, dun, dun. Um, it's coming right for us. So, two and a half billion years in the future, like we'll all be dead. The Earth may have been demolished by then. Uh, here it comes, it's going to merge. Whack. That's what's going to happen to the Milky Way. This is actually a realistic simulation based on the observed sideways motion. And it's going to go through this merger process and make a giant electrical galaxy. And we've already named it. People have decided to call it Milcomoda. <laughs> Seriously. So the Milcomoda galaxy will be twice as big as ours, or three times as big roughly, and it'll be a giant elliptical galaxy looking like this. In about six billion years. Um, so that's the future. So I'll finish off this is a picture of the future sky. So this is what it looks like today. In about two billion years, we'll see, we'll see this. And then there'll be a big mess. Like that. And we'll live in an electrical galaxy at the end of it. So that seems like a good note in which to end the, the session. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Carl. That was fantastic. Okay. Guys, we're going to have about a 20 minute break now, okay? We'll really be until 7 until 7 to 15. Uh, take the opportunity to go to bathrooms if you need. They're on either of the sides, just past the doors. There's also activities in the foyer. 
live feeds from NASA missions. Uh, then there's interactive experiments outside, and of course the telescopes, which are just in the water. Okay, we'll see you back again at 7:15.